Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text this evening comes from our gospel reading from Luke chapter 18. We read <laughs> verses 9 through 14. Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So far from God's holy word. Dear fellow redeemed, beloved of God, when Martin Luther d died on February 18th, 1546, a scrap of paper was found in his pocket with his final seven words, a mix of Latin and German, which I'm going to attempt to say, though I'm sure I'm going to butcher both the Latin and the German, but it said something like this, Hoc est verum, versin allen Bettler. Well, in English probably makes more sense. This is true. We are all beggars. Last words of Luther. Elsewhere, Luther had written that before God, we are all beggars, really, with an empty sack in our hands. We have nothing of ourselves at all, nothing to offer to God. Everything that we have, anything good, anything at all, comes from God. It's especially true, then, when it comes to righteousness. It's not just that we are people that are generally good, that we're a little bit good, and that we just need a little bit of righteousness to get us up over the top, to somehow get us across that finish line. We are, by nature, unrighteous. We're unholy. We are enemies of God. We've got nothing that merits God's help. By nature, all we have are all sorts of sins, and all of those sins deserve God's judgment. So when it comes... To grace and mercy, we are beggars with empty sacks. We don't bring anything to God that would cause him to help us. We've got nothing to show, nothing that would make God give us even the time of day. But for Jesus' sake, of course, God fills our empty sacks. He fills us with grace and faith. He fills us with life and forgiveness and salvation. He fills us overflowingly. It's undeserved because Christ did it all in our, pay, in our place. He paid with his suffering, with the, common, with the condemnation that he bore for our sins. Apart from Christ, we are like the prodigal son in another one of Jesus' parables. We're hungry, we're poor, we're sitting among the pigs. But because of Christ, you're in the Father's household, seated at his banquet feast, wrapped in the finest robe of righteousness, that righteousness of Christ. That righteousness, that salvation and life that we have, remember, it's always undeserved. It's not like once we're baptized, we're kind of on the right road, and then as time goes on, we get better and better, and over time we need less and less of Jesus' borrowed righteousness until we attain that fact when we have enough of our own that we don't need Jesus anymore. Nope, it doesn't work that way at all. We're always in need of grace, and so in that sense... We really are always beggars. This is true. It's this understanding of our own condition and what Jesus has done for us that puts us in the right frame of mind to consider and understand the theme that we have for our midweek Lenten series this year. Repent. Turn to Jesus. The Christian life really is a life of repentance. And so it's my prayer that as we go through this series, through the Lenten season, that we'll gain a deeper understanding of what this life of repentance is really all about, and therefore our faith will also be strengthened through this. In our sermon this evening, we are encouraged to repent, and we're also discouraged from doing something else. 
we're encouraged to turn to Jesus, but discouraged from turning on in on ourselves. And so we're encouraged in these ways through a parable that I'm sure for most of us is pretty familiar and probably seems pretty easy to follow, right? We would look at this and say, of course, the Pharisee is bad. He's just way off. We identify more with the tax collector because we've been raised Lutheran or we've been in the Lutheran church enough to where we know that, of course, we're supposed to be the tax collector and not this pompous Pharisee. And so we can easily identify this. Maybe we, maybe we see easily how this parable all plays out. But before we so easily identify ourselves in this way, let's sort of look closer at this parable. You know, traditionally, we hear this Pharisee's prayer as a very boastful prayer, especially since Jesus tells us that this parable is taught to those who despise others, who treat others with contempt. In other words, who treat others as being less, lower than they are. We hear this prayer, verses 11 and 12 of our text. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Notice how many times I is in this prayer. Is it really much of a prayer? Not really asking God for anything, is he? He's just telling him all that he has done. This is usually how we view this, right? And it sounds very pompous. He's blatantly boasting before God and saying, you should love me more than you love this tax collector because clearly I'm better. But maybe this parable also is told of a Pharisee who is really earnest and sincere about wanting to do things to please God. Maybe he's saying it more in this way. God, I'm working hard to please you. It isn't easy. It's not easy to keep your laws. Deep down inside, I would rather charge a little extra money for my services rather than give tithes. I'd rather keep some of that for myself so that I could buy the things I want. I'd rather look out for my own interests rather than be completely fair with the people with whom I deal. I would rather simply do what I want all the time. I, I sort of envy this tax collector in a way because he just kind of does whatever he wants and doesn't worry about the consequences at all. But I know it's wrong, and so I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like him. I don't want to be like him. I am working on it, Lord. That's not all that pompous sounding of prayer at all, is it? That's the prayer of somebody who's struggling with sin. That's the prayer of somebody who's trying to do the right thing. Somebody who's actually trying to keep the law. And, and you can probably identify some of the temptations that he's dealing with. Sometimes we would rather just do what we want rather than trying to follow God's word. Maybe this Pharisee is a pretty good guy. The kind of guy that you wouldn't mind so much if he was your next door neighbor. But either way, whether this prayer of the Pharisee is this pompous, boastful prayer as we often look at it, or whether it's a far more subtle prayer of someone really struggling to try to keep God's law, it still ends up in the same place. You know, it's easy to spot the sin if this Pharisee is simply obnoxious. It's easy to spot in this prayer of the Pharisee where he's basically saying, God, you have to love me more because I'm better than the tax collector. His sin is obvious. And so we can look at it and with our Lutheran training can say, well, no, of course, in front of God, he's not, he's not any better than the tax collector. He's not saved by his works. His tithing and his fasting isn't doing anything for him. And his attitude toward this tax collector, the lack of love that he has for his neighbor, shows the true condition of his heart. That's his sin. That's why he doesn't go home justified. That's easy to see. But what if the Pharisee's prayer is one of an earnest and sincere nature, a guy who wants to do the right thing, a guy who struggles with temptation and works hard to be righteous? Righteous. 
What if this is that good guy that you'd want to be your neighbor next door working so hard to try to be that good example of a follower of God? The answer is, that guy still doesn't go home justified. Now why? Because as, as sincere and as earnest as he is, he still believes that he is earning God's favor by trying to do the right thing. He still believes that he's working his way up from being that, be that, that beggar with the empty sack to finally that place where he, again, doesn't need the Lord anymore because he's worked hard enough. Now, he might be a nice guy. He might be the kind of person you'd want to be your neighbor. But he still goes home unjustified on his way to hell because he's turning to himself rather than looking to God. Whether that prayer sounds boastful or earnest, it still treats other people with contempt. Blatantly or subtly, it, it says, God should love me more because I am doing better things than this person that's over here next to me. Worse, though, it treats Christ with contempt. It says, I may have needed your forgiveness at the beginning. I may have needed a lot of your forgiveness even at the beginning. But I need less and less of it as time goes on. And at some point, I've, I'm going to have it figured out. It really sort of makes amazing then what the tax collector does in our text. He's really sort of an amazing guy. Maybe not in the way that he acts. You know, that Pharisee is probably a much better guy than this tax collector. Much more a person that you'd want to live next door to you. But he gets it. The tax collector is convinced by that truth that he has nothing. He has nothing that would make God want to help him at all. He knows that he's a beggar with an empty sack. And so he stands far off, unworthy to come close to God at all. He doesn't even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he bows his head. He prays, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's a great God-pleasing prayer of faith. Of himself, this tax collector says, here's the sum total of who I am. I am a sinner. And in fact, literally, in, in the Greek, it's, he's not just saying, I'm a sinner, but the definite article is there. He's saying, I am the sinner. In other words, he sees himself as the worst sinner of the world, in the world, the chief of sinners, as Paul once said about himself. He's saying to God, there is nothing in me at all that deserves your help. Of God, the tax collector says, although you are a righteous God, I know that you're also merciful. And so I ask you to be merciful to me. What a prayer of faith. A tax collector says, I'm a beggar who's got nothing and who deserves nothing. So don't help me because of who I am. Help me because of who you are. Because you're merciful. What a prayer of faith. And what an understanding of who God is. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And that word that's translated be merciful, in the Greek it's that same word as the noun propitiation. Propitiation is the atoning sacrifice for a sin. So what he's literally saying here is, God, be the atoning sacrifice for my sin. Or as another translation puts it, turn your wrath away from me. He understood God as a just God who punishes sin. He understood that he deserved to be punished for his sin, but he also understood that God is a merciful God. This is the reason why he repents why he turns away from himself completely and he turns to the Lord. It's this tax collector then that goes home justified because he's the one who trusted, who trusts in God's undeserved mercy. Again, that Pharisee might be a better guy outwardly, but the tax collector is the one that goes home justified. Jesus concludes then in verse 14. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. No matter what the Pharisee's tone, whether that boastful tone or that more subtle tone, he exalts himself. 
he's working hard, even if it's working hard at being humble, he's still sort of exalting himself. Lord, I expect you to help me because of who I am. That's basically what he's saying. It's this tax collector who speaks the truth, that very humble truth, I'm a beggar with an empty sack. The only reason for you to help me is because of who you are. You're merciful, and I trust in your mercy. This is what the Christian faith is all about. You know, so many people think that the Christian faith is about a series of good works that we do, the good things that we do. And of course, the good works that we do are important. We ought to be doing good things, but it's not going to earn us anything. It's not going to earn us any favor with God at all. The Christian faith isn't about that. It's about turning to him in repentance. It's about turning away from ourselves and turning to Jesus. No matter how hard we try, we are never going to find any righteousness or worthiness in ourselves. We are never going to find any hope of salvation in and of ourselves. We know passages like Psalm 52, verses 2 and 3. Where the psalmist says, God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God. Every one of them has turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. We know passages like that, and yet, despite the fact that we know that, there is that little Pharisee inside of each one of us, isn't there? By nature, we are tempted to believe that if God loves us, it has to be because there's something lovable in us. We see this in all sorts of just little things in life. We see how this human nature works, works out. So if you're attractive, you're happy that you are better looking than somebody else. If you're smart, you're happy that you're smarter than other people. If you're a hard worker, you're happy that you're not a slacker like so many people are today. If you're talented, you're happy that you have some skills that will attract attention better than some other people do. That's simply how that sinful nature makes us think. We think of ourselves in comparison to others. And we tend to focus on those things that make us better than other people. We find our worth in what we have and what other people don't have. This can be sort of a subtle form of contempt for other people, but it is contempt nonetheless. And if that's how we think, if we compare ourselves to other people and, and compare ourselves on the basis of I have this and that person doesn't, then think of how that mindset presents us before our God. Our subtle, subtly, our sinful nature tricks us into thinking that there again that there's something that make God love that makes God love us and then all of a sudden we're thinking to ourselves I am so happy that I'm the way I am and not like somebody else and there's that Pharisee coming right out of our mouth but the truth is that as we stand before God standing before God is sort of that great leveler sort of that great leveling of the playing field. No matter the amount of giftedness, all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. Our worth and our value before God does not come from who we are. And if you want proof of that, keep in mind that there are many beautiful, smart, talented people in this world who are on their way to hell because they're not believers. Our worth before God comes in the worth that Christ gave us when he died on the cross for our sins. Our worth before God doesn't come from our virtue. It doesn't come from the high moral standards that we might have. It doesn't come from any good works that we might do either. Our worth is a matter of grace, the grace that has been given to us for Jesus' sake. So don't turn to yourself. There's no hope there. If you seek to exalt yourself, you're going to be humbled. Instead, turn to Jesus as the, as, as the tax collector did. Humble yourself before the Lord, and you will be exalted. 
And the reason that will be exalted is because of how Jesus humbled himself. The Lord of glory. He became that suffering servant. That's what, we're, that's what we celebrate during this Lenten season. The fact that our Savior came to be that suffering servant for us. He took on the Father's wrath. God couldn't, of course, ignore our sins, so he put that sin on Jesus. And so Jesus humbled himself. He became the chief of sinners so that you and I, chiefs of sinners, could, be, could become sons and daughters. Listen and be amazed at Jesus' role reversal here. Our Lord is the ultimate example of the humble being exalted. In words that we'll read later on this Lenten season, we'll read from Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, where Paul writes, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Because Jesus humbled himself to make that payment for our sins, God has now highly exalted him in heaven, and there will come that day when every knee will bow and every tongue will have to confess that Jesus is Lord. And because of his death for our sins, we too will be exalted. We will spend eternity in heaven with him, not because there's any value in us, but because he gave us a value by dying for our sins. So repent. Turn to Jesus, not to yourself. Come before him as that beggar with an empty sack. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, he fills those empty sacks with his mercy and his grace. By his grace, Christ gives us all things. He's merciful to us, and for his sake, the kingdom of heaven is ours. He justifies us. So turn to him because he has forgiven all of your sins. Thanks be to God, in Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.